Hello again. I'm Sue Swinand. Welcome to another half hour of Arts and Ideas. We have a real treat for you today because we're in Auburn, Massachusetts at the studio of a very fine visual artist, Rosemary Lebeau. And uh, I have known Rosemary's work for many years. I remember seeing her work at the one of the early Arts Worcester biennials. And uh, I can still remember that work. It was it stayed with me. It <laughs> was very uh, engaging and uh, memorable. And I'm delighted to be here with you, Rosemary, and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for being here. It's a great treat to have you here today. Well, I am just blown away by coming into your studio because everywhere I look, I, I don't know where to begin. It's, it's, it's really overwhelming, and it, it, it's a visual delight. How long have you had the studio in this, uh, what was the history of this studio? Um, the history of the studio was um, I, I built it about five years ago. Um, before that, I was literally working out of my kitchen. Mm -hmm. uh, everything, well, not everything you see here because most of this has been uh, constructed since I've had the studio, but I had um, a lot of things stuffed in closets and cabinets and I uh, had a tiny little space to work in and I actually had to rent a storage space for a while for after acquiring some equipment and things I knew that I would need in the future. Yeah. But for five years I've been working in this space and filling it up and uh, it's pretty much to the brim. <laughs> <laughs> you need another studio. I need another one. Well you know that's one of the things about sculpture is it really takes up a lot of space. Yes. And uh, so you need space, yes. but it must be an absolute delight to come into this environment and be able to work surrounded by your treasures and your inspirations it and is. so forth. Uh, it's a wonderful treat, yep. Uh, so you've been a dedicated artist for many years. Mm, uh, yes. Tell us a little bit about how you got started in the arts. Okay, uh, I've always known since I was a little child that I loved art and I um, uh, never really thought that it would be something that I could make a living at. Uh, so I always had other jobs, but I've always loved art. I went to art school. I went to college for art. and um, Where did you go? I went to Mount Wachusett Community College when I was still in high school. Uh, I was able to graduate a year early and start um, on my art career early and then from there I went to the Worcester Art Museum School which was a wonderful part of my formative years and the main photographic workshops which taught me a lot uh, about what I needed in photography and then to uh, the University of Massachusetts to finish out the program and um, you know I've taken classes in many 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 places and my education just keeps going. You are a, a constant learner. Constant. I know you're one of those, I think that's the most important factor in a person is that they they just can't learn enough. They mm -hmm. are constantly looking to learn more. Right. And uh, that's what makes your work so exciting, I think, too, is that it's constantly growing. Thank you. So you started out as a photographer. Mm. Somehow that's hard for me to grasp when I look at your work because you seem to be such a hands-on materials manipulator mm. type of person. And right. uh, how did uh, how long were you with straight photography, and how well, did, what what happened then? I never really stuck with straight photography. Uh, I learned how to do the darkroom photography, and then from the point where I pretty much got that under my belt, I was just pushing the envelope. I always liked to work with materials, and I'd start out with a um, a traditionally generated photographic image, but then I would manipulate it, I would uh, tone it, I would hand color it, I would make it three-dimensional, I would build things out from it. Uh, I'm, I was never satisfied. Glue things onto all it. Kinds or of things, <laughs> make layers and, you know, yeah. all kinds of um, You're really more playing. of a sculpture, I think. You know, I was thinking that when we were talking about the studio, it is so wonderfully put together and beautifully considered that the studio itself is almost like an environmental or a uh, an installation work well, thanks. because everything is just so specifically placed and related mm. it really is a thrill to be here thank you thanks um so i noticed that you really 
I mean, I look at this work and I think this work could be in any New York gallery. It could be, uh, and yet I have the feeling that you don't really make a great effort to get your work out there. Uh, can you talk a little bit about your philosophy of sure. work? And uh, yeah, it's not so much a philosophy as it is um, a need to spend um, maybe spend some time organizing the business end of art, which um, it's really not my forte. I'm not interested in, you know, uh, and people have gotten on me over the over this, but uh, I've had a website that's been under construction for two years. I've got people who are helping me photograph the work, and you know, I just come up to the studio. It's like a full-time job. It's hard to do that. I'd it really is a full-time job. I'd rather to do get right down and just start yeah. swinging a yeah. hammer. You know, I I I'd, I'd prefer to make art as opposed to organizing my business end of it so much so that I can get out there. I think that at some point it's just inevitable that somebody's going to find me up here in the woods in Auburn. I found you. <laughs> I found you. And somebody, say, you know what, let's take care of somebody that Somebody used you. to say to me, you can't hide your light under a basket. Okay. A very okay, that's, old that's friend nice. of mine, and I would like to believe that. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know. It seems like so many artists that are out there are just shining their light in all directions right. by right. beam, you know. Right. Well, maybe they're shining their light yeah. to blind you. That's, my, you know? that's a little bit of it, you yeah. know, that 15 minutes of fame kind of thing and, you know, get your, package your image right. and then market it as big time. Yeah. No, that's not really my no. thing. Uh, well, I admire the fact that you have the integrity and the will and the dedication to make your work independently and uh, you know, not be influenced by the market, and not be influenced mm. by the whole drive to get it to New York or whatever. So I, I find that very admirable. But having said that, I <laughs> noticed that you have a few shows that are local coming yes. up. Yes. Uh, this month, actually, mm. April 2010, yes. where are you going to be this month? Uh, April, well, actually, Friday night is the opening um, at Arts Worcester called New Again. And that is a, um, an exhibit of recycled art or art that's made from other objects. So I have a piece that in that That would be right show, up your alley. Right up my alley. And I have a brand new piece that I, I delivered with the glue still wet. Uh -huh. The paint was still wet. Uh -huh. So I've barely seen that piece yet. Um, I have another piece. And the Arts Worcester Gallery is at, oh, on at Main Street. Uh, Main oh, Street, the old Aurora Hotel. Um, 660 um, Main Street correct. at the Aurora Hotel. And yes. that's a free opening. And, the, and it'll be there through the month of May, I think. Friday night. May 7th. Right. Uh, and it ends May 7th. Mm -hmm. Okay, and what else? Then we have also... Um, the Anna Maria Faculty Show, which is uh, going to be hung next week, and it should be on uh, on display for the, the through the month, month of April. Through the month also. of April, and then the Goddard the Goddard House Show, which um, is a an annual show, uh, and that's their eighth annual. They're eighth going annual. strong, and it's a theme show this year called In and Out of the Box, and it's uh, work that is reflective of artists who work either literally within a box or maybe you know just or just metaphorically, metaphorically out of the box actually I'd like to tell a little bit more about that because uh, um, you you have work in that show I as do. do many other of the artists in the Worcester area and it's kind of a unique uh, exhibit because it's organized by a woman named Woody Allaire who used to have a gallery in Worcester many years ago and I think it's because of her uh, drive that the thing came about, but uh, I, if it, the Goddard House is at 1199 Main Street in Worcester, right off of Webster Square, and uh, the exhibit is free and open to the public. They have a huge opening with a chocolate fountain and champagne and it's lots of fun, and um, there are quite a few artists exhibiting and uh, there are also quite a few events taking place during the exhibit, artist demonstrations on April 25th, one to three, a poetry reading, lots of different events. So uh, you might wanna check out the website and get the details. And um, uh, maybe you'll be able to get over to, to that show and see some of Rose's work. 
I'm so anxious to show some of your work, and uh, I guess the best place to begin is with some of the photographs. Uh, this is an early piece, I assume? It is, yes. Yep. And uh, it's a beautiful formal photograph. Is it hand colored? It is. Yes, black and white hand colored photograph. Uh huh. Yes. Um, what the viewer can't see, what you out there in TV land can't see, is that this image is embossed. Would you call it embossed? Well, it's not really embossed. And I think you know, I I share this technique with my students often. Um, it's it's painted with nail polish clear nail polish so that it actually builds up on the surface and becomes very um, shiny. There's a relief of about a, oh, maybe an eighth of an inch mm. almost, that it feels like braille that you could run your hand over. So the image and the photograph have become something other than uh, a, 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 a two-dimensional right. uh, illusion. Right. They become a physical object. Exactly. It's like little glass beads. And I think this is kind of significant because all of your work is so object-oriented. And, mm -hmm. and to have the photograph be not an illusion, but rather an object, I think is quite interesting. Thanks. Uh, it's really a beautiful piece. Do you have another? Thank you. Let's I do. show that one. I do. This one um, does not have any relief on it, but it is a black and white photograph um, that I, I shot in a junkyard. Of an old pedal. We're a little bit wacky, Rose. Very wacky. I wanted to show this one because I thought it connected somehow to Rose's other work. I mean, it is a straight photograph, but you can't help to get this spooky, spooky <laughs> quality. It's it's that edge between humor and revulsion or humor and terror. It's a little dark side. Yeah. It's a little dark side. Oh my but goodness. That's I think what makes much of my work, uh, it gives it a little hook. It, it kind of draws people it, in. It has, it has many different levels of thinking and looking, and, uh, but it also um, relates to the idea of the abandoned pieces of detritus and sure. Sure. history that uh, are overlooked but yet are so significant. So I think that one connects to the later work. I, I agree. I think... Um, I concur. So you started out with photography, but then that you didn't stay there very long. You uh, you moved on, and what happened next? Yes. Well, I got very interested in alternative process photography, doing all different types of um, experimental processes. And uh, through a series of workshops and classes that I took, uh, I learned about the transfer process where um, a, f a photographic image can be transferred onto a substrate where you can manipulate it better, like a watercolor paper. And um, I tried several different processes uh, and chemicals and um, different uh, types of uh, solvents in order to get the transfer to be um, to, to be successful. And your husband's an airbrush artist, that I know. Helps so to he, he knows a lot about these kinds of materials. He did, and he's been a great coach as far as uh, um, give, I informing me about solvents. So uh, he and I got together and we found uh, a solvent that worked well with photographic, uh, photocopied transfers. So I um, you take a photograph and I go down to Staples and I have a photocopy made and transfer the image onto a watercolor paper. And maybe the audience could notice that it's a mirror image. Yes. So yeah. the image is photo photocopied and then you reproduce it? That's right, that's right. Uh, I, I'm really interested in having um, things be symmetrical. However, what I like the most about the fact that the uh, two sides of the image go together is that um, oftentimes I can change things so that it's not symmetrical. The people in this side of the image look different than the people in this side. Uh, this is well, almost her like eyes are closed, her eyes are open. Right. So there's that double take. You do right. it. It's like a parlor game. <laughs> a you know? double take. But right. there's also this strange <laughs> curiosity cabinet yes. kind of science <laughs> about True. it, where it's almost like Siamese twins. Well, I want to just point out a few fun mm -hmm. things about this piece. There's a monkey in the window here and there's no monkey here, and this is a little baby harp seal, and over here it's the back of a cat, and uh, you know, there's this strange little creature. And all of this imagery came about how? It came about because the, uh, the actual transfer process is not 
perfect and I will get little bubbles and puddles and so things. So you're basically getting little patterns and yes. textures and surfaces right. that promote you or provoke right. you exactly. to imagine and I just fantasies what's fantasies. already there. Exactly. So and it's really the process that's pulling you along it is. to create these imaginary creatures. Right. And some take me months to do, so I need to be entertained in the process. So as I'm drawing these all this texture of the foliage, you know, maybe um, a, a little skeleton will pop out here or some kind of a lizard yeah. will come out of there. So that makes me, um, it's just, an, it's enchanting and it's very entertaining for me while I'm doing the tedious It's like work. a zen It is, I <laughs> experience. get an experience. But I, I should point out that the drawing part is actually all these thousands of little tiny dots yes. that uh, enhance and uh, make more specific the uh, form that's in the image. I also want to point out that you're beginning to incorporate a sculptural dimension into these images with the creation of frames that enhance and again make the whole thing more of an object than a right. sculpture it's than, starting to become than a two-dimensional image. Right. Let's show one more of sure. that. So here's another one that uses that uh, transfer drawing process where she's stippling over the transferred photo uh, with thousands of dots. But on this one, you've gone one step further. Yes. And what, what's happening here? Well, from starting uh, to playing a little bit with sculpture on my frames, um, I decided that I wanted to um, start building things that had some depth to them. So this is a little bit more three-dimensional. And uh, it's a shadow box type of thing where uh, the glass itself is has been sandblasted and etched with a pattern of um, stems and roots and flowers. It's also like bars, though. <laughs> it is. It is. Actually, I don't know if you if you can see the image very well, but this piece is called "The Prisoner Who Was So Poor He Fell in Love with Jail," and it's about somebody who's so destitute that in their um, I love the title. It's yeah. a beautiful title, and and in their um, in their despair their inner life can become so rich that what might be a prison can actually flower. And, and wow. this is filled with lots of wow. fantastical you know, that, creatures. We could go in a whole new program with that, con that discussion. Uh, I love the way the shadows of the etching are cast onto the figure as well. Thank you. That helps with the depth. You know, if you have if you have a little bit of space between the glass and the drawing, and the lighting is right, it definitely makes it makes you feel like there's a, a cage, um, you know, encasing the drawing. And I've done an awful lot of um, etched glass pieces where uh, you know I use all kinds of flora and fauna and all mm -hmm. different imagery. And it becomes very much, so you're using the photograph, the, the, the transfer drawing, and the etched glass. And, right. And how did you get that etched glass, I want to hear. My etched glass <laughs> comes from my, my husband, who uh, I'm very lucky to be married to an artist. And um, he paints motorcycles. He's a custom motorcycle painter. And uh, he has to sandblast the paint off the old tanks to paint the new ones. And uh, he's... So sort of he's been your out. instructor and guidance in this he's been process. Great. Well, he's my collaborator. That's we great. do a lot of things that together. That is so nice. Yeah. Right. Right. So um, yeah, thank goodness for his sandblaster, uh, and and now we're able to incorporate that in some artwork as well. So now we're uh, looking at some of your three-dimensional assemblage pieces, or they're really full-fledged sculptures, and. Uh, I'm, I'm interested to know where you get all this <laughs> stuff. It's overwhelmingly I interesting. Do. I have a lot of stuff. I, I'm a collector. I've been a collector for a long time. Um, I get it, uh, you know, it's the flotsam and jetsam of everyday life. I pick it up on my walks down the street. I go to junk shops. I go to flea markets. Uh, people will know that. Tell I me that you thing. go to the junk shop once a week. I do. <laughs> I do. I try to hit up a flea market or a junk store um, once a week or so. I love the And then something flea speaks to you, something just catches yes. your imagination. It's rare that I come away with nothing. And I, that yeah. object will kind of spark your imagination? And it, it will, or else I will know that at some point. I'm going to find a purpose So you just for put it, it aside yeah. until it comes together with something else. Right. Well, exactly. you know, we were talking about that, how putting two found objects together or two found images, how the juxtaposition actually creates different meaning, whole right. new meanings that right. 
they never had by themselves. But sometimes that's the impetus for my, or the catalyst for my piece, is that a piece, an object will come together with another object and boom, there's some And there's the some one. tension, some exactly. excitement. Exactly, sure. So, so this piece, for example, incorporates the etched glass. Yes. It incorporates the photographic images. Mm. It's, it's really, uh, tell, can you tell us just a little sure. bit about it? Uh, it incorporates the written word, which is a very big part of my, uh, the meaning of my work. Um, oftentimes I think that going from my, the book form and incorporating the visual, the imagery um, is important in a book, but also in my objects. The, um, the words that I pair with the images are often um, the thing that really pulls the meaning out or really speaks to the soul of the viewer. So and you're working with many medias. Yes. The, the verbal, the visual, mm. the tactile, all right, of the that. Right, the sculptural. Yeah. The, um, and I love to work with things that are very well worn, that are discarded, that um, have you know seen their use and seen better days. And uh, I collect them, and I think that the age and the sort of patina or the, oh, yeah. the wear of the object sh um, it speaks it, to the importance of it, to the fact that it was it survived so and it, survived. Ex it existed at one time. Right. Now these are images of women in France. That's right. Said? They're they're actually uh, taken from an old medical journal uh, from an early psychiatrist who was studying the um, effects of of hysteria in women at the turn of the century in France and how they were so poorly treated and psychiatry at that time was such a misunderstood um, science and uh, you know some of these objects here represent some of the rudimentary me medical materials that they yeah, might have used. Yeah. And, uh, you know, lobotomy special. Yeah, Let's not lobotomy. go there. Yeah, no, it's, it's a fabulously intriguing piece. Uh, well, I'm really glad we can show a couple of these books. Uh, after the etched glass, you started, and of course you were etching words into glass True. as well. That's right. And then you were saying you got interest, you were always interest, interested in written word. Right. I love writing, and um, I felt that having just one image, one picture, one uh, piece of art, uh, displayed on the wall didn't tell a story. It wasn't allowed. It was just the allowing me to yeah. exactly to give the whole narrative. So I felt the natural segue was to get into um, creating books, and so I started making handmade books. And I did a lot of traditional books, and I started working with different forms of books, uh, and then they started to get a little bit more sculptural. And here is a piece here that's a pretty sculptural book, and it's made from a found object. It's actually made from a child's toy violin, little. Uh, squeeze box and uh, I, I took it apart I deconstructed it and I utilized some vintage photographs of women and it actually starts out from young childhood in, in, in a girl's life up to young womanhood here and then on the back it's into the sort the of an old, older age yeah. and each picture has a caption uh, which is really the the soul of the woman speaking to that moment of here's um, one little caption the silence between us was so profound one pure and one not and those are just collaged into these women's uh, images right and this piece is uh, called epiphanies. epiphanies so it's really like it, the moment of epiphany for each woman and so I felt that this was this was a little bit easier for me to be able to extend my uh, thought process and to actually have a, a linear and convey thought. more meaning. Exactly. Right. Okay, so I want to show one more book because they're just fabulous. But this one uh, is called 105 Degrees. And as you can see, it's really a sculpture. But uh, the 105 was a near death experience you it had, was. right? As Tell. a child, I had a very high fever and I went up to 105 degrees. And this book basically tells the story of me being sick uh, at Christmas. I'll open the book. Um, and it it's echoes the um, crucifixes that people have hanging in their, their homes um, for uh, the last rites, when people needed to have the last rites with the holy water, etc. Um, but this is a little tablet book that uh, has an image of myself as a child. And there you are, that's, that's your face. Me. Again, and her photography. Exactly, and this happened at Christmas time, so I'm holding some Christmas lights, and it tells the story of um, my experience um, of having such a high fever and hallucinating and talking to the picture of Jesus on the wall and um, feeling like I was feeling the same way he did at his, um, with the terrible um, suffering that he well, that's a, enjoyed. That's a real uh, treasure. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.
So this is the name of your studio, I see. Lucky Eye, Happy Heart. Yes. Lucky Eye, Happy Heart. Tell us about this piece. This piece is called The Angel of the Lost and Broken. And uh, what she actually does is she collects all of these very significant parts of my life where things are broken. Um, this is my husband's wedding ring, which uh, he's a sandblaster. So he's blasted his ring so thin it's broken. And um, so we got him a new wedding ring. So she's taking care of that. And she just has all these very precious objects that I have uh, broken. And then also when I lose something, I just have to whisper to her what it is. And wherever it is in the world, she's protecting it. She's okay. the angel of the lost. Okay. And whose glasses are these? Those are mine. Those uh -huh. I bought at the, um, uh, they're, they're antique glasses that I loved. I wore them for many years and I ran over them in my driveway. So, so she's taking care of them. She's the collector. She's my collector. And um, yeah, just love her. She's got two mismatched legs, and she's pretty broken up herself, and she's got a broken heart. And so we're completely into the three-dimensional sculptures now. Right, right. Well, this has just been uh, a fabulous experience, and I wish I could just keep showing more and more of your work, but I want to thank you again for having us, and uh, don't forget to look for Rose's work this April at the uh, Goddard House show uh, and also at uh, Arts Worcester, the uh, Anna Maria, Anna faculty, Maria show. faculty show. Great. So um, I had so many more things I wanted to ask you. Thanks Let for me visiting. just do one more thing. What's the best thing about being an artist? Oh, everything, everything. Uh, I, I always say we're the luckiest people in the world. We have the key to happiness. Yeah, you know? it makes life rich, doesn't it? Fabulous. Rose, there's just so much to see here. I feel like I can't stop. I just want to keep on showing more and more of these things and having you tell me about them. But uh, unfortunately, we have to say goodbye. And thanks so much for spending the time with us and, and for telling coming. us about everything. And uh, you people are very lucky because don't forget, you have three opportunities to see Rose's work in person, which is very important to see it in the flesh because you can't really appreciate it on TV as much. So remember, uh, you can check the websites for the Goddard House exhibition, uh, the um, Anna, Maria. Anna Maria faculty show, and the, Arts Worcester. and the Arts Worcester show on Main Street. And they're all through the month of April 2010 and actually extending into May a little bit too. So uh, hope to see you there and join us again next time for more Arts and Ideas.